Dear son, when I was a boy, I, uh... Huh. There's two of you now. Dear sons, I grew up on a small farm in rural Pennsylvania. By the time I came around, there wasn't any livestock left, unless you counted the family dogs. It was just vegetables, mostly corn. It was my grandfather's farm, so bit by bit as his children grew up and started their own families and got new jobs and moved away, he had less and less help. So one by one, he removed obligations from his daily checklist and simplified things. Cows gone, chickens gone, onions gone. But my cousins and I lived in houses... You know what? It would just be easier to show you. Pap's house was here. And my house was over here. My cousin's house was here, and my great aunt and her children lived here. Coincidentally, this is the house that my mother was born in. All through here was forest, and these were the cornfields. We lived on the side of a small mountain with a stream that ran through the property below. Throughout the year, my cousins, my sisters, my brother and I would help Pap on most of his projects, whether that be in one of the garages or in the fields. Summers were peppered with my parents saying, Hey, Pap needs help with something. Or, Pap himself would call, Hey, I need help with something. Or, we'd see Pap putting slowly along on his tractor and we'd ask, Hey, need help with something? Throughout my life, and up until the day he died at the age of 89, even after swearing he'd do less and less every year, and never ever doing less and less, Pap was a farmer. But he wasn't always just a farmer, even though he grew up on his father's farm, which in time became his farm. He was also a sheet metal worker, a coal miner, a florist. Apparently he was one heck of a polka dancer. My brother and I played with our cousin almost daily growing up. We spent a good amount of time in the woods, exploring, climbing trees, riding bikes, walking alongside of, and all too often inside the stream, most likely wearing our brand new sneakers, building at least a dozen forts in various locations, all fortified with pine cones and a pile of good throwing rocks to fend off invading imaginary armies, and obviously our sisters. But for all intents and purposes, we were farmers too. We planted the seeds, we disked the fields, we fertilized, weeded and harvested by hand, counted and packed boxes, we helped sell at the farmer's market. The only thing we didn't do was drive to deliveries, and that's because we weren't old enough to drive. As I got older and went to college, I took on a variety of jobs and worked on the farm less. I worked loading clay targets at a gun and country club, dishwasher, made and served pizza in the mall, construction worker, resident advisor, mortgage sales rep, data entry, freelance writer, editor, graphic designer, video game critic. So many adults self-identify by occupation. And I think what's worse is we also tend to identify and categorize others based on their occupation. And that's a dangerous thing to do. What people do for a living is a terrible metric for how good that person is. How do you rate a farmer, miner, polka dancer, or a graphic designer, dishwasher, pizza maker? In college, wandering the forest paths that we had cleared as boys became a luxury. When I graduated, I moved out of state to explore a bigger world. The new experiences can be beautifully addictive, but they sometimes come at the cost of the little things. I miss the smell of the air of the cornfields mixed with the forests just as the sky turns pink in the evenings while riding my bike in the hollow in the warm summer or hearing the rain pour down and create waves on the rye as we'd watch the thunderstorms roll through the valley from the panoramic view of our garage door. Now that I'm an adult, if I could call up an old boss and ask for one job back, I would. No matter how soaked I'd get from the dew on the leaves, no matter how early I'd have to wake up, no matter how many patches we'd have to walk through, I'd gladly pick corn with my grandfather once again. But, picking corn doesn't pay much. For a 12-year-old me trying to buy video games, it was a gold mine. For 19-year-old me who needed money to get back to college, it wasn't enough. Plus, the mall had girls. More importantly, girls that had no idea that I was a gigantic geek. June 1998. I had finished my first year of college and moved back home for the summer. I was rolling dough in the back of the pizzeria, learning basic Italian from the owner's father. And by basic Italian, I mean he was teaching me all the fun, dirty phrases before moving on to, hello, my name is. 
Over the radio came the words, Tornado warning for Irish Valley and blah 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 blah, some other places that suddenly don't matter because I don't live there, but... Irish Valley. Ever since I was a kid, it was my understanding that Irish Valley would never see a tornado. It's too hilly, too many trees. Quite frankly, tornadoes have no business there. Never had a tornado before, what the heck does this tornado have against my home? But there it was. Not tornado watch, not strong wind advisory, tornado warning for Irish Valley. I hung up my apron, calmly sprinted to my car, and drove the 31 miles home in the insane wind and rain and huge hail in about 20 minutes. In hindsight, it might be one of the dumbest things I've ever done. But I made it home. No tornado, but the power was out and my mom, sister, and father were just shooting the breeze in the kitchen around a candle. No power means no pump. No pump, no water. No water, no shower, and I smell like pizza sauce, garbage, and bleach. Also, no video games. I talked myself into a state of security, joked about my intense drive home, Mother Nature versus a Ford Escort. The rain and wind had calmed down, so my dad went out to check for damage. He came in pretty quickly and said, Everyone into the basement, now, in his serious dad tone that I'm still trying to master. We all piled into the basement with some flashlights, made sure the dog came with us, and we sat in the coal bin. I couldn't tell you how long we were there, and none of us remember what we talked about, or if we talked. But it sounded like a train was rolling right over top of us. And then it just stopped. All of it. The noise, the rain, the wind. I walked into the yard and looked at the house. Still there. I stood in one of the fields and tried to let my eyes adjust to the darkness to see if any of the trees in our woods had been knocked down when I noticed... nothing. Though I was standing in a field, there was no wind, no trickle on my arms, and no noise either. No crickets, no birds, no cicadas. Just warm stillness. A false tranquility like I've never experienced outdoors before. A terrifying void like someone hit the pause button on reality. My brother came home from his job, and together we walked with flashlights across the fields and tried to get to Paps through the woods, but there were too many downed trees, so we went through the hollow to check on Pap and our cousins. Everybody was okay, but there was a lot of damage at Paps. Off to bed. No need to say anything about it. It was going to be an early and long day tomorrow. Pap needed help with something. It didn't feel like I woke up late, but without an alarm clock it was hard to tell what time it was. At first light, a good number of my aunts and uncles had returned to Pap's house and got to work. Nearly every window was shattered, his roof had seen extensive damage, the front door to the house and one of his garage doors were peeled right off the hinges and dropped unceremoniously in the driveway. The roof of the barn had ripped off like a tin can. A number of us noticed that there was light shining through the back of one of the garages and took a closer look at what was the cause. The wind had separated the cinder blocks, lifted the entire top of the building up temporarily, and then set it all back down on a single rock. But everywhere was trees, some uprooted, some snapped off. One crashed right through the middle of a car. All day long we were cleaning glass, chained trees to tractors, hauled them off and set them to burn in one of the lower fields. Of course, Everyone was relieved that no one was hurt, but we were all shocked by how drastically different the landscape around us was. The water in the stream had run completely dry. There was nothing in it. And when I could sneak away for a second or two, I grabbed my camera and snapped off some pictures. It felt like something worth noting. Ever since I was a kid, I would never so much as put my hands in my pockets when Pap was working on a project. Hands in pockets was a nonverbal cue that you were either unwilling or unready to help out, and you certainly can't fix anything with a camera, so I did my best to stay out of the way. This is my Pap. Not the tall guy in the foreground with the hammer, the small one with the what the heck are you doing look on his face. Yeah, he was probably annoyed that I was taking pictures, but that would pass. In a way, it was nice to see so many people coming together. For a few days, we all put aside our jobs and became Pap's helpers once again. A few of my uncles who fought regularly when they got together not only cooperated, they were actually caught joking. I remember mentioning it to Pap, saying how nice it was that his sons called a truce, 
I'll never forget what he said in reply. Sometimes it takes a tragedy. At the end of the first day, as the sun was going down, I walked through the woods and checked on the locations of all of our old forts. Every last one of them demolished. Not like I was going to wait in ambush for my sisters to come over the ridge as a college student. I guess I just wish that the winds of change weren't so darn literal. Turns out there was more than one funnel that came through the valley that day. One path of trees had been blasted in a line to the north of our house, one just a few dozen yards to the south of us. Our house split the goalpost. We were all lucky. When the power was restored a couple of days later, we all finally took showers. By then, I still smelled like bleach and garbage and tomato sauce, but now mixed with gasoline, pine trees, dirt, oil, and sawdust. Now that's the scent sensation you can taste. We tried to settle back into our idiosyncrasies to restore a sense of normality. For me, normal equals video games. At the time, I was playing Final Fantasy Tactics, and it felt really good to power it up once again. Final Fantasy Tactics came out on January 28th, 1998, half a year after Final Fantasy VII, which came out on September 7th, 1997. Final Fantasy VII was nothing short of a juggernaut for the time, and because of it, Final Fantasy Tactics was missed by a large chunk of its potential audience. Without a doubt, Final Fantasy Tactics is one of the greatest games in the entire Final Fantasy franchise, and even today, I'm certain many people overlook it because it's not a numbered entry in the series. To this day, there's never been a proper sequel to Final Fantasy Tactics. There have been spin-offs, Final Fantasy Tactics Advance for the Nintendo Game Boy Advance in 2003, and there was a sequel to that called Final Fantasy Tactics A2 Grimoire of the Rift that was released in 2007 for the Nintendo DS. But Neither of those games seem to capture the magic of the original Final Fantasy Tactics. Also, neither of those games were on a home console. If you've never played Final Fantasy Tactics, imagine you're playing a game of chess, but the board isn't flat. In fact, there's various elevations, sometimes to the extreme. In chess, everyone starts with the same pieces and the same layout. In Final Fantasy Tactics, the player only brings his or her own favorite pieces, and those pieces can level up. It would be like a pawn graduating and becoming a knight, or a bishop, or a rook after using it for a few games. Or that piece can get better at being a pawn and learn new attack and defensive maneuvers. But if that piece dies on the game board, it's gone forever. Now add in dragons, and magic, and a large overarching storyline, and you have yourself Final Fantasy Tactics. The game is difficult, at times brutally so. The super tough learning curve and challenge without hand-holding turned a lot of people away in its early stages. But those who stuck with it, like myself, found an engaging game that was not only rewarding in the way it's played, but also in its storyline even though that storyline is more convoluted than it needs to be. The main character, Ramza, who I always named Ranza, get it? Randy, Ranza, my name is Randy. I thought it was clever. Ramza is the bastard son of the noble Beowulf family of knights. In the start of the game, Ramza and his lifelong friend, Delita, who is not of noble birth, eh? Can you smell the potential conflict growing? They enlist as cadets in the military. Their orders start simple, quell minor uprisings within the city limits. But as the flames of war start to spread, their missions become more complex, not just in lethality, but in morality. As these games go, war erupts, and it's clear it's not about border skirmishes or trade disputes. There's a lot of class warfare involved. Backstabbing is par for the course. Delita and Ramza are sent to kill starving deserters, fighters who don't believe in the wars started by nobility. 
A rift grows between the two best friends until Delita's sister Teta is kidnapped and held for ransom, being mistaken for nobility at Ziegden Fortress. Delita and Ramza attempt to rescue Teta, but arrive at the same time as Ramza's older brother Zalbag, who orders her execution to quickly eliminate the rebel forces. Outraged, Ramza fights back against his brother's forces and wins, though his brother escapes. Delita goes to his fallen sister, and while he mourns her, the large gunpowder storage inside the fortress detonates, and Delita is believed to have perished. Disgusted by his brother's behavior, Ramza leaves his family, sheds his father's name, and attempts to fight for his own beliefs, law and justice. Delita, who did survive the blast, fights for vengeance and class equality by puppeteering the rich and the noble into eliminating one another. Super long story short, people in power fight for more power, while civilians and soldiers suffer and die. Delita is the commoner who becomes the king and brings order to a chaotic realm, while Ramza wipes out his noble name, becomes a commoner who also happens to save the world from the resurrection of a super demon by the hands of the church. Needlessly complex? Absolutely, but still highly entertaining. It gets way crazier and introduces buckets of characters from across the globe, all with their own plot lines. The story often hits on themes of power equality, and the preciousness of life, and obviously, class consciousness. And the player really feels that struggle. Damn the oligarchy! Hooray for the proletariat! But what the game cleverly does, and the player often doesn't realize it, thematically it makes the player the unseen and unheard elite class in this tiny society. Remember how I said earlier that it's difficult to judge someone based on what they do for a living? Final Fantasy Tactics makes you do that the whole game. You absolutely judge your units and your enemies' units based on their jobs. Your recruits start as squires, and as they level up in their job, new jobs open up to them. Priests, wizards, summoners, thieves, ninjas, mediators, geomancers, knights, ninjas, singers, dancers, etc. You don't want a team of just squires. You want the highly sought-after mathematicians and the samurai. And then along come specialty characters that know skills right from the start that your recruits can never learn. With a limited unit count, the player will often have to dismiss soldiers. Despite being a tactical role-playing game, players don't truly role-play as Ramza. Ramza is not your avatar, he's your lieutenant. He follows your orders and has his own distinct personality. He will leave behind soldiers to die in battle at your request for the greater good. He harshly dismisses soldiers from your squads at your command who beg to stay because of an unseen relationship that these characters have. The game makes you a gigantic hypocrite. And it's just one of the reasons why I love tactics. It's like a Shakespearean tragedy, but in video game form, and made with these delightful little sprites that shoot fireballs and summon otherworldly creatures upon one another at your request. Chess, plus a leveling system, plus a twisted story, plus dragons and magic, plus a great challenge, plus one of the best soundtracks ever. What is not to love? As I've gotten older, I appreciate the political intrigue of tactics a little more. It calls into question the difference between what is right and what is good. Young adult me loved the crazy over-the-top supernatural end-of-the-world storyline, but current adult version of me now thinks that story could have been ten times stronger and more interesting without it. The game is a little grindier than I remembered, too. I loved the fights for a long time, but I put my characters on autopilot for the final quarter of the game. But coming after Final Fantasy VII, they had to do what they could to stand out. In fact, there is an appearance by Final Fantasy VII's famous character Cloud in Tactics, and an unnamed Flower Girl who looks just like Eris. People always want to know my superlative list of favorite Final Fantasy games. I guess they go 6, Chrono Trigger, be quiet, it totally counts, 9, 7, Tactics, and then, I don't know, 
pick a number that's not 8 or 10. Let's say 12, but 8, 10, and 13 are pretty much fighting each other for the bottom of my personal list. Playing Tactics again was a real treat. Not only is it great to contrast it with contemporary games, it was a nice stroll down memory lane. It's one of my chronographic pushpins in my mental map of 1997 and 1998. I still vividly remember playing this when I came home from college after my freshman year in our old house in the valley. After my spring semester finals, I must have slept for 18 hours straight on my old bed in my old room amongst the sounds and the smells of the familiar. And then we were smacked by some tornadoes. But that's life, right? Right when you think things are at their calmest, unstoppable chaos erupts and the world you know changes irrevocably. It's the same story for everyone. And like tactics, no one's path is a straight line or mapped out for them. Heck, we don't even get to pick where we start. What you set out to do and what you actually accomplish will sometimes be two different things. And that's okay. Love, Dad.